So as a neuroscientist, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist as well as a, as a psychiatrist. And what I wanted to do was focus a little bit on both the neuroscience as well as the, the clinical aspects of uh, brain stimulation and magnetic brain stimulation in particular, so that everybody in the audience gets a sense of how, how is it working, why does it work, and does it work? And I was trying to kind of think about the questions my parents ask me about what I do as a psychiatrist when I use TMS. So I'm going to start with some basics, right? We all have a brain, hopefully. Um, there's estimates vary, but probably the best estimate is around 86 billion neurons in our brain. And each of these neurons has about a thousand connections, some way more, but on average about a thousand connections. So 86 trillion connections in our brain. And what is, what does a neuron do, right? We talk about neuroscience, but I just want to give everybody in the audience a sense of the main job or one of the main jobs of each neuron is to carry information from one place to another, right? So an example is when we see things, light and, and stimuli come to neurons in our eye, in our retina, these neurons go back into our thalamus and send a message to neurons in our thalamus, which then go on to our visual cortex. And when our visual cortex gets activated, we start seeing things, right? So that's the job of a neuron is to send messages. How does a neuron do this? So, you know, the connections, we talked about how there's 86 trillion connections in our brain. That's one neuron connecting to another neuron. And it does this in a synapse. And the, the messengers are chemicals, right? So neurotransmitters, which you all have heard about, are what the neurons use to communicate with each other or talk with each other. And all, almost all psychiatric medications, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, medications for Alzheimer's disease, medications for uh, uh, psychosis, they all work on these chemicals. They, they sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease the chemicals, sometimes they block the receptors so that even though chemicals are there, they can't send messages. So that's how most psychiatric medications work chemically. But the thing is neurons also work electrically. Neurons use electrical activity to pass signals through themselves before they get to the synapse. So when two neurons are talking to each other, we talked about that synapse, which is chemical. But to get there, imagine a neuron from my eyes going back to my thalamus, that's electrical. In the thalamus, it makes a connection, that's chemical. But then that neuron from my thalamus travels back to my brain, that's electrical again. So neurons use electricity to send signals, even though they also use chemicals to actually talk between each other. So the electrical properties of the neurons is very important. And when we measure brain activity, a lot of what we're measuring is this electrical activity. So imagine one neuron would be very hard to pick up, to detect. But when a lot of neurons are active together, we can actually measure that. And you just heard some talks about brain waves and alpha waves and gamma waves. And the, the, the reason why we can pick up these brain waves using EEG is simply because a lot of neurons are activating all at the same time, sending electric signals. And it's amazing that this works, but it works. We can record activity using EEG. We can actually record magnetic fields using MEG, magneto magnetoencephalography. So these are the tools we use and we use as neuroscientists to try to understand what's happening in the brain. They're also tools that depend on the fact that the brain is electrical. Um, you know, I'm sure that everybody, many people in this audience have seen pictures of the brain from MRI machines and fMRI. And again, these are related and are likely driven in large part by the electrical activity in the brain. They're not electrical, but they're related to the electrical activity. Just as a quick note about brain imaging, whether it's fMRI, EEG, MEG, brain, brain measures in humans are a little bit like measuring light activity and trying to know what commerce, what, what economic activity is happening in the country. It's related, right? It, you get some clues, but we're missing a big picture. 
And a lot of what neuroscientists are trying to do is get a better, more detailed view of what's happening in the brain in order to come up with better treatments for depression, um, any other psychiatric disorder, any other neurologic disorder. And a lot of the work around brain stimulation has really been driven by basic research in neuroscience, which is why it's a very exciting field to be in. So now that we've got some of that background out of the way, um, let's talk about some of the big questions in brain stimulation and the area of brain stimulation. So one question, I talked about medications working chemically, but instead of changing the chemistry of the brain, one simple or basic question is, can we directly activate neurons electrically? And one of the pioneers in this, in this area, one of the giants in, in the area of brain stimulation is this neurosurgeon called uh, Wilder Penfield. So Wilder Penfield, he was, he was kind of this uh, amazing, amazing neurosurgeon, neuroscientist. And he came up first with the insight that epilepsy, back in those days, we didn't have a good sense of what epilepsy was or what to do about it. He, he came up with this conclusion based on pathologic investigations that a lot of the reason, some of the reason people have epilepsy is because they have scarring or other kinds of damage in their brain. And that if you could, as a surgeon, he can do this, if you can cut out that part of the brain, some people will have less seizures or less, less, less epilepsy. Their epilepsy is better managed. So that was very, very insightful. A second major insightful thing that he realized is he could actually do these surgeries in awake patients. He could use an anesthetic preparation and actually the brain doesn't have pain receptors. If I touch my brain, as soon as I get rid of the scalp and the skin surrounding the brain and everything where there's a lot of pain receptors, the brain itself doesn't feel. So he would put electrodes in the brain and he would stimulate all over the brain. And he did a lot of these studies and helped to map out what different parts of the brain were doing by passing little pieces of stimulation. And for example, when he did this over motor cortex, he was one of the first people to find out that actually a lot of our motor cortex is representing hand and face movements because we are good with our hands and we're good with our faces and not for our toes, for example, because we don't move our toes very much. But he also made some other fantastic discoveries that you could get very complicated perceptions from brain stimulation as well. So I'm gonna read this example. When an electrode was applied in the gray matter of the temporal lobe at 0.23, this is a case report, the patient observed, I hear some music. 15 minutes later, the electrode was applied to the same spot again without her knowledge. I hear music again, she said, it's like a radio. Again and again, the electrode tip was applied to this point. Each time she heard an orchestra playing the same piece of music. When the electrode was applied again, she began to hum a tune and all in the operating room listened in astonished silence. So he found that it's not just simple motor actions, you could pass stimulation in a part of the brain and get very complicated perceptions. Um, now this is more recent. This is a case report from 1999 when surgeons were implanting an electrode for, for Parkinson's disorder, which is a, sometimes a, a treatment for refractory Parkinson's disorder. And this is what they found when they were stimulating one particular site. During the post-operative evaluation, the patient's face expressed profound sadness within five seconds after the current was delivered. Although still alert, the patient leaned to the right, started to cry, and verbally communicated feelings of sadness, guilt, uselessness, and hopelessness. I'm falling down. I no longer wish to live, things like that. Amazingly, her depression disappeared less than 90% seconds after the stimulation was stopped. So these are the kinds of studies that, that help answer that question. Yes, stimulation can affect the brain in a way that's meaningful, that's complicated, that can evoke very complicated but immediate changes in mood and thinking and feeling and hearing and sensing. Okay, big question number two, can brain stimulation be used to treat complex disorders like depression? Now, this was a study again from, this was a study back in 2005 by uh, Helen Mayberg and Andres Lozano and others. 
And what they did is they honed in on a brain, a part of the brain called the subgenual cingulate cortex. This is deep inside our brain, underneath a lot of other tissue. You can only access it really through surgery. But a lot of studies, including some of theirs, had shown that too much activity in these parts of the brain was associated with depression. And when people took medications or ECT or other treatments, activity in this part of the brain seemed to calm down a little bit. So they said, what happens if we put an electrode in there, working with surgeons and neuroscientists, and try to suppress activity in the brain? And what they found, so with stimulation, they found all patients, patients spontaneously reported acute, that means immediate effects, calmness, lightness, disappearance of the void, a sense of heightened awareness, interest, and, connect, and connectedness. Now, this is still a work in progress, deep brain stimulation, and I'm not going to talk too much more about it. Um, some larger sham controlled trials have not been positive, um, but there's still enough interest in the idea that many researchers are still trying to figure out, is there a good or the right target in which stimulation can help treat people's depression over the long term. That's the, that's the big goal here. I just wanna highlight that a lot of these brain regions are related to things we think about as core features of depression, not being motivated to do anything, not feeling enjoyment, um, not just, just kind of feeling blah or negative or dark. And these are the parts of the brain regions they target, uh, regions involved in reward and punishment and things like that, they're very deep. Um, one of the recent attempts at doing this actually uses a brain recording in amygdala to trigger stimulation in one of these reward regions. And this was recently reported on in the New York Times and everywhere. And so this is a, this is a big deal because it, in a way, is a smart form of deep brain stimulation that people are hoping may work, even though the, the other forms didn't. Now, this is getting to the, the important part of our talk. So I told you why electrical stimulation can work because our brain works electrically. I told you that people have shown that it does work with invasive electro electrodes. What about if you don't want an electrode implanted in your brain? And I work in a treatment resistant clinic and most people would not want electrodes implanted in their brain. So this is one of the tools we use for non-invasive brain stimulation. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a method that can actually affect the electrical activity of the brain about two to four centimeters deep. So we can't get really deep with a TMS coil, but we can get deep enough to actually uh, affect the brain and affect neurons in the brain. And I'll show you how we know this. Um, one of the things about how TMS works is it's actually based on physics. When you create a rapid alternating magnetic field, that induces an electric field. So we're actually able to inject electric current into the brain using a magnet. This is what it looks like. And what I'm showing you is we can use TMS to stimulate somebody's motor cortex and get their finger to move. And this is exactly what we would do when we're clinically mapping out how much energy to use for somebody's action. And you can see when I stimulate uh, uh, his finger moves, his hand moves, I'm decreasing the amount of energy I use. And you can see it gets a little bit more focal. I can stimulate and pretty soon you'll just see a thumb movement. So amazingly enough, TMS, can penetrate deep enough into the cortex to stimulate single digits, kind of like Penfield did. The first demonstration that this was possible was back in 1985 by this British guy named Tony Barker. And it created a sensation in the field. Everybody immediately realized like, hey, this is a tool that people could use both for research, but also for clinic clinical purposes. Now I wanna get back to this picture. All of these targets are super deep right? PMS can't be used to affect these targets. It's superficial. It affects the superficial parts of the brain, not the deep parts of the brain. So how does it work? Well, we, we have found through research, through brain imaging studies, like I was telling you about, 
that this deep part of the brain that seems to be involved with depression, the subgenual cingulate and other regions like it, are actually, actually seem to be uh, anti-correlated, so regulated by prefrontal brain regions. So when there's more activity in prefrontal cortex, it seems like there's less activity in these depression-related regions. Um, this was kind of a nice model then for how TMS could work. By stimulating or boosting activity in the prefrontal cortex, we're actually able to cause activity patterns in larger distances away from prefrontal cortex that's helpful of regulating these deeper regions that we do think is involved in depression. This affect network that I talked about that a lot of people are doing brain stimulation in, and also other parts of the brain that seem to be involved in negative ruminations or otherwise anxiety and other things like that. So that's the main way we think TMS is working is by stimulating this target for, it, for depression. That's how we think it's working for depression. By stimulating the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we're affecting brain networks in, in distant areas and we can directly activate it and modulate these networks. The first trials for using this as a tool for depression happened in the mid 1990s. And uh, they essentially said, well, one time is probably not enough. What if we do a, a type of stimulation, it's called repetitive TMS, where we're stimulating rapidly uh, over a burst. And in those days, the protocol was anywhere from you know, 10 to 40 minutes. They hadn't really dialed it in. Um, but they said, what happens if we do this every day? Eventually, would people start feeling better? Could this be a treatment for depression? Right? Could this replace some other things that we sometimes do, like ECT or things like that? And early studies were pretty positive. And so just to give kind of a general timeline, you know, TMS was first used in the 1985. FDA approved it actually uh, based on a, a, a large sham control trial in 2008. Other studies have followed and have generally shown continued positive results. I'm gonna highlight one of Dr. Daskalakis's recent studies. It's one of the largest studies published in Lancet, you know, one of the, the best medical journals. And it's one of the largest studies for TMS. And it was actually a pivotal study that changed how we do TMS. And it's probably going to change how most people do TMS. So I told you TMS was approved for depression. It's been used. But up until this point in time, the protocol for depression was somebody had to go in, come into the clinic five days a week for four to six weeks. And each time they would come in, it would be a 40-minute treatment. And what he actually tested was there's so, there were some neuroscience-based studies that showed that a three-minute different type of stimulation protocol called theta burst would be just as effective. And they, what they found is if you look at the blue, that's the three-minute version of stimulation. The red is the 40-minute version. The outcomes for depression were identical. It also gave us one of the largest trials in estimating the effects of TMS almost 50% of people who are resistant to medications will respond to this kind of treatment. That means they had a reduction in depression of about 50%. Their depression is cut in half. And a third of the people who get this treatment won't have depression at all anymore. Um, just to highlight for everybody who's interested, the worst side effect is a seizure. We're stimulating your brain. We can accidentally trigger a seizure, but it's pretty rare. It's about one in 30,000 times somebody delivers a treatment. I imagine it's kind of like people who are sensitive um, and there are certain conditions that can put somebody at a higher risk of having a seizure. And we generally try to screen for that when we're deciding who should get TMS. Um, other side effects tend to be pretty well tolerated, things like headache, dizziness, and um, just vague things that people experience right after the TMS. I'm going to finish by saying a lot of que basic questions, how do we do it, have been answered, and many of them actually by our new chair, which is very exciting. There's a lot of research questions that remain, and a lot of it is actually involving neuroscientists working with clinicians, working with engineers to kind of come up with 
with answers. And the, the questions are things like, where is the best place to stimulate? Where should we stimulate for different types of disorders? And there's all kinds of research of TMS for substance abuse, uh, psychosis, you name it, people are trying to see if TMS could work. How to stimulate, just like I talked about with Dr. Daskalakis's early results, um, how you stimulate could, could change how long you have to do it or how effective it could be. Uh, using MRI or EEG to personalize the brain stimulation, combining TMS with psychotherapy, meditation, or other behavioral or lifestyle practices. And just to highlight what Dr. Mishra said, uh, the three of us are actually working on a trial right now together where we're trying to use TMS in conjunction with a breath-based meditation task to see if that meditation can augment the effects of TMS, make the TMS work better. Uh, so I'm out of time and actually that's the end of my talk. Thank you.